and Port Zero. I don't hate the idea of Showtime opening up with Stargates, making a couple Void Rays, because that's obviously what he's been practicing a lot, that's what he's good at. The only thing I don't want to see, Nate, is to go for that ultra late game. Because I think no. if we ever make that scenario where we do get up to six, seven bases for this man, 20 plus poor crawlers, both the spellcasters, all the air upgrades, I just don't think you beat this man. So I'd love to see Shotan try to prevent that scenario. But let's see what the first best of three has in store for us. In the bottom left side, we're looking at the main base of the man that's representing NZ Sports. It is Saddle. And his opponent spawning in the northeast as the blue Protoss player representing B.I.G. He is Showtime. I love that they're starting off on 2K. Apparently the map that's been most frequently picked and I don't think that's going to change. I feel like whenever 2K got introduced, not recently, but obviously in the previous new map pool that we had quite some time ago, we looked at this. We're like, all right, 2K is great. Beckett is too small. Blackburn is like, ah, oh, it's not bad, but most people don't love the slow zones. And I feel that everybody that played a couple games on 2K is like, yeah, this is just a good map. And it really does feel like a little bit of a modern equivalent of Lost and Found. Even if it's very different, it just feels that everybody kind of likes it. And it yeah. honestly provides a lot of good games. You know, it's, it's it's like when they take our lunch order, Kevin. Nobody's, nobody's going to say no to the chicken nuggets. 2,000 Atmospheres is palatable and easily consumed by all and remains one of the most popular maps as there's not anything super crazy to have to deal with here. So as far as the options go for strategy, I have to agree with you. I think trying to go to the the, the uber late game against Cyril is, is, is a mistake, but Showtime is not a player that we, we really typically talk about being the super aggressive, cheesy kind of guy. Yep. And maybe he'll have to play against that expectation if he wants to have a chance in this series. That's of course the reason why I think in most people, including us, we're like, okay, Cyril to zero. Just because you know Showtime's a really good player, he can take it. He can take it to the late game. He can fight against the best of the best. But you know the the goat, as it were, lives a little bit above the best of the best. And the season finals definitely kind of have been Cyril's stomping ground. Mm. Out of the previous five editions, Cyril has won three of them. Reina managed to win the other two. That's obviously mighty impressive, especially if Cyril manages to somehow win this one too. It'd be four out of six, and you know that's spread over almost two years of StarCraft. <laughs> Just goes to show that. <laughs> 2018 may be a while ago, but this man absolutely still has it. They're going to have to rename it the Serral Pro Tour eventually, Kev, if, uh, if he keeps up that level of dominance. There is that Stargate for Showtime that we were talking about. And, of course, this is, the, you know, the dominant meta in PvZ. If you want to play a macro-based build, even if you're not necessarily going straight for Void Rays or Mass Void Rays or Carriers, mm -hmm. you get that Stargate to help take the third base, but also get a little bit of scouting against the Zerg too, right? And it's safe early on. I mean, Serral's obviously not a very big cheeser, but once in a blue moon, if he feels that certain Protoss players are a bit stubborn or they don't scout, he will actually hit you with like a 22 drone Rogeling attack, you know, just to keep the opponents honest here and there. Uh, Showtime is going to open up with an Oracle. Now that's interesting. It could obviously be Oracle into Void Ray, but sometimes it could just be double or even triple Oracle. Now I don't know if Showtime is really big on the triple Oracle hype train in this day and age, but let's see what he uh, what he does after the first one. Yeah, I mean, we always talk about like that utility that Oracle can keep the third base safe. Uh, you can go scout, harass, use the revelation. And the Void Ray was kind of the popular option because it's you don't really run out of energy defending. But there's a second Oracle, Kev, so not going for a quick answer to the Overlord. That does mean that Serral will have plenty of time to see everything going on in the base. He would have always been able to see this second, This excuse me, he would have always been able to see the Stargate since there's an Oracle coming. But <laughs> Showtime he's, doesn't even send it across the map. He just immediately takes the third. Yep, just making sure that he can actually get this Nexus up. Like once that Nexus has a bit of HP, you're actually kind of... Mm, at ease to send a couple of units out because even if Sarah would have eight links there, the second Oracle can deal with it. Third Oracle has even been started up. So this is where things get really interesting. It is important for Sarah that his units are in the right position here and that he doesn't take too much damage. I'd say it's almost inevitable that you don't lose one or two drones, but you definitely don't want to be losing six or seven. Yeah, even Revelations right at the front too. So trying to clear out the creep and put an early bit of pressure onto that spread from Sarah and like you're talking about, third Oracle makes me, gives me a little flashbacks so that summer where Stats was like, hey guys, this is the new build for PVZ everybody's going to use for six months, and I don't think it's a bad strategy to break out at all. Of course, you could do a lot of pressure with that, especially if they get together a little bit down the line. Sends the shades over towards the base, just trying to pull these units apart, but 
not committing just yet. It's actually quite cool to just use revelations here to pick off a couple of creep tumors. It gives us a little bit of a TVZ vibe. <laughs> yeah. But it, it makes sense, because uh, obviously the queens are normally very annoying, especially if you have three oracles. You want to sneak in from a weird angle, but if the Zerg always sees you coming, the queens will always be in the right position. So in this way, Shotam is just kind of fighting over creep. It's a new take on things, but I kind of like it. He doesn't want to have to move all the way in, and the thing is, by doing it this way, those oracles are also able to keep the adepts alive. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, I'm in your face, I want you to think about me attacking you, and I don't want you to think you're safe, but at the same time, he's not going to completely commit with everything and force some crazy YOLO fight early on. Robotic wow. space coming in, plus one attack, getting an immortal. And look at that roach speed as the lair finishes, Kev. It's a cool strategy what Showtime is doing here. And obviously his macro is good. He's at 62 probes. I like the robo bay as well. But one thing I do get a bit concerned, when we make five adapts that, doesn't, that don't have resonating glaives and you make triple oracle, I do feel you're supposed to get a couple of drones here and there. It doesn't have to be the jackpot. You don't have to get 20, but just a few to annoy Saro to slow down his economy a little bit. It is important because this is a big investment. And here we go. Showtime is going to try to get that economic damage for the first time and gets four drones. Now the queens are actually coming in from both angles. One oracle does get picked off. I think Shoten was hoping for a little bit more. It seems like he was really distracted by these links of Sarah on the other side of the map. Yeah, I was controlling that immortal and some of the adepts over by the third base like you were talking about. He's getting a prism behind this and adding some gates and charge. But I have to agree with you, Roddy. You're investing into the adepts. We know that late game-wise, it's uh, they're not very reliable. Usually they do get thrown away, kind of like Hellions almost, because they're not going to be big fighters in those late game battles. But losing one of the oracles too, like we, we talk about having all that energy is really nice for the scans and keeping the vision and harassing, but he, he loses a lot of steam early on, it feels like. It does feel that Showtime is gearing up for a big attack, right? Plus one is almost done. Charge is on the way. He already fired up a War Prism. Maybe it's not like an all-out committed attack, but I think this is kind of the attack where if I can drop a couple good force fields, maybe shave off a few roaches, pick up a Ravager or two, then I'd be more than happy. It really does suck a little bit that Showtime lost one of those Oracles, especially because he lost it for no reason, right? It wasn't necessary. He could have easily saved it if he was paying attention. Yep, couldn't agree more. Get some force fields. The Queen's able to actually slip out, though. Biles will shatter those force fields and let the Lings get a little bit closer. But it's still a lot of units. You know, Cyril has to respect this. And I, I'm, I'm trying to think. Do you, do you feel all the revelations earlier on the creep tumors have set this attack up to be a little bit better? Or? Yeah, I, th I think otherwise that creep is probably all the way near his own like watchtower. And then it becomes a lot harder to really be in the face of Serral. I think so far Showtime is mostly trying to be annoying. As he continues dropping some adapts, unfortunately does not get any damage. Uh, it is safe to say that he hasn't done a whole lot. We talked a lot about Showtime. Meanwhile, for Serral, he's honestly not skipping a beat. Hive is about to finish up. Aspire has already been finished up. The Baning Nest has been planted down now as well. We've got plus two missile attacks on the way. I mean, that is an eight minute and 15 seconds great Aspire, Nate, and two Vipers on the way. That is terrifying, Roddy. Even straight into the adrenal glands as well as the melee upgrades. Now, disruptors are being made. We saw the contamination on the robotics facility earlier, shutting down the ability to produce that disruptor, as you can see in the production tab when it's uh, when that happens. It's just that bar is just empty. Just got to chill for about 30 seconds before you can actually continue to build that unit. Why did we warp in those Dark Templars just at home? Because I see a couple Archons on the way. So Showtime does not have a Templar Archives. He does have now a few Archons. That's going to make this attack even a bit uh, more powerful. Plus two, halfway done. He is obviously not going to face Broodlords right here, right now. But if he's a bit indecisive and he goes back and forth for a minute, there will be Broodlords out on the field. And Sarah's maxed out. He's got Blinding Clouds to work with as well. I hope for Showtime that he's got a different plan other than this army, because this army doesn't seem like the kind of army that beats a maxed out Zerg Nate. No, not at all. There's the abducts, pulls in both of the disruptors. There's still one more in the back, but it's going to have to do a ton of work. Gets a decent shot, but there's so many Lings and Banes. The Zealots were killed almost immediately. The insane amount of roaches. This, well, it's like you were saying, Kev, it's a maxed out army. I didn't really necessarily dislike Showtime's composition, but he's Let's pushing in with 140 one. supply against 200. And <laughs> well, it's not just Roach Ravager. You have the Lings, the Banes, you have Vipers. Uh -oh. It's all, even almost the anti-timing, right? He came in before Adrenal, he came in before Bane Speed, but Cyril still had more than enough to crush that army. A DT gets warped in to try and help push it back. 
as he starts that fleet beacon. And I guess, Kev, is, is it a little too late from this situation to just try and switch to the Stargates? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Shota might think if I can get a couple carriers out, there is always some hope. Sometimes, uh, I guess, Zerg players do get overly passive, right? We joke sometimes about uh, a player like Soul or Spirit, that when he can end the game and he's not going to drop a couple of extra command centers. Some Zergs do this too, but Sarah doesn't really strike me as that guy. Because Sarah is not just good mechanically, he also has phenomenal game sense. And Von Phoenix has a dream of picking up. <laughs> Goodbye! Yeah, kind of asked for that one. I mean, Saros maxed out. I think he's just ready to trade out some units and see if he can find some economic damage. This is nice, though, by Schult. I mean, if we don't take damage at home, and maybe the Zealots find some success on the other side of the map, we could still have a game, but the numbers don't lie. 122 army supply for Saro, only 30 for Schult. He's just forced to tap out. Uh, the definition of bulletproof there, Nate? Oh, yeah. Look at look at that. Look at that. He's like, oh, take sips. Like, hmm, okay. Good start. Look at the murder face of Saro. Ah. Uh, He's a, he's a terrifying opponent to go against. And Showtime's strategy in that game, it was it was kind of like, he's like, I'm going to do, it's like, I got this really cool build. I've got this part, this part, this part, this part. And he's like, well, you have seven different things you're trying to do at once. And Serral, I mean, he can handle seven things at once, but for Showtime trying to do all of that to pick him apart and everything, it just seemed like he was trying to do a bit too much. The or Losing the Oracle early on, mm -hmm. killed like two or three creep tumors with the adepts, but you know, like you were saying, you invest all of that early resource count into those units, but they have, I mean, they don't have mid-late game value and he didn't get any workers to start either. Like I think what Shilton was also hoping for is to either find more economic damage or at least force out some more units to really properly slow down Serral. Because yeah. then that follow-up push, like for instance this one, that's supposed to really hurt Serral's economy. If Serral was forced to make all these units, let's say, of 65 drones, it actually becomes kind of an unpleasant game for the Zerg, but Serral really droned up at all the right moments. I mean, this attack just was never going to be it. Serral was literally maxed out. We were kind of fighting on creep, and I don't think that Showtime expected to face Vipers. Nine minutes and 20 seconds into the game, and I can't even really blame him for it. It's just that Serral is that good that he would have all the right units, and uh, having a Dark Shrine instead of a Templar Archives is obviously very unfortunate at, at that point. Yeah, if you scale that army up to 200 supply for Showtime, then it's you've got a really big force, a lot of immortals and charge lots, and potentially able to get force fields in front of the banelings before they can hit. But he tried to move out, and it was like, okay, if I can just mess with your economy, I think like you were saying, force units earlier with all that harass, then mm -hmm. maybe he's not able to build that big late game army. But it's so terrifying that even as he tries to make that attack, Sarah's not only maxed out, but had all of the hive tech like you said the eight minute greater spire like what, what are you gonna do against that yeah and we did kill a couple of drones if we're on team showtime eventually it was like four but then obviously losing that one oracle because sarah was distracting him trying to be annoying with links on the other side of the map but also killing four drones when the zerg already has 60 plus workers that obviously doesn't have the same impact as killing four drones when the zerg has 28 workers right that really properly sets them back and that slows down for or that slows the zerg down for quite some time and at that point, it's just a little blip in the economy of Serra. He's like, well, lost four drones, can build 12 more at this point. So this man is perhaps going to have to ramp up the aggression a little bit to slow down that Finnish Phenom on the other side of the map. This man representing Team Big, it is showtime. And his opponent in the bottom right, looking stellar as ever. The Finnish Phenom, like you were saying, Kev, he is Serra. Overall, this is going to be a fun day, though, because of course there is always that potential for Serra vs. Maro, and I think that's something that every StarCraft 2 fan around the world will always be excited for. And I think that these siders match at the end of the day, that could be an absolute banger, too. Yeah, there's a lot of things that we have to keep in mind, of course, where, you know, you're like, Serra, of course, fantastic. Maru, definitely the other player in the group. I think everybody has their eyes on. Showtime and Nice, they're, they're kind of in the position... Uh, of the Terrans from yesterday, right? Where it's like, okay, we know that they're good. We know that they're very strong within the region. Showtime's had a much better result. Uh, and I think he was talking to himself about actually being able to make it yeah. to the season finals, First not time. even just the, the playoff stage of EU. But it's just, it's always a tough look at the draw because there are no bad players in these groups for the most part. Like you, you don't just get to cakewalk through no matter how well you're performing, needing to get through either Serral or Amaru uh, in a decider match is is the kind of thing that's well, that's just terrifying. That is, but I guess if we drop here, then maybe Showtime can get ready for a PvP against Nice, get some momentum going. 
and then uh, hopefully perhaps for him, the winner of Cerro Amaro makes it a very long series and that the person has to go down to the low Tire him out. <laughs> yeah, exactly, it's all possible. But yeah, we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. It's a long day of StarCraft to go. I also know, one, by the way, we had a little tweet coming out that apparently today, today we're going to show the Raynor signature series Ooh, as well. Ooh, I like that, I like that. I saw a 15 second give teaser a, on Twitter. Give me a spoiler, Kevin, are you in it? <laughs> no, I'm not in it. <laughs> I'm not in it, but I, I'm I, very I, excited I, for it. I had a dream where he where he had that one said, my big brother, Rotterdam, always has my back. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen it yet. That's the cool thing, actually, for all of us. We haven't seen no, the we, we, they, we don't. Either. We don't get those. They, uh, you know, they, they don't trust us. We get too excited. We let something slip. But we're as interested in seeing that as yours, of course. The Clem one was fantastic. So it's always great to get a little bit of a, a peek into the other side of the screen. They're wholesome. Just makes you feel cute. All right, Stargate, it is going to be once more for Showtime, but this time we are going to switch things up a little bit. So he has replaced the Oracles this time with a Void Ray. That could just be one safety Void Ray then into an Oracle, maybe even double Oracle, but it'd be a bit odd. I always feel, Nate, when I see one Void Ray, there's more where that comes from. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, you, can't, you can't have just one when it comes to these bad boys. So here's the real question then, Kev. As far as Berlingrad as a map goes, it's one of our new maps this season. You know, none of them really seem like they're, you know, super crazy. There's a couple of weird quirks on a few of them. Uh, but is this, is that late game air toss style versus Zerg? How do you feel about that one on this map? Is is this a place where it could be a little bit stronger? Is there a reason why Showtime might try to do that here? Or, or are we just getting way too far ahead of ourselves because it's not that great here? I, I have no idea. Uh, absolutely no idea. I've seen a couple of late game scenarios on this map, uh, and I'm sure that Showtime has played plenty of late game PvZ on this one already, but the problem is most Zerks are also not Serral, and Serral can be a very, very patient man if necessary. Um, but oh. I, I always kind of believe in air builds or sky toss builds as long as you don't sit back forever. Like I feel like eventually don't be afraid to fight near a couple sport crawlers if you have that air upgrade advantage. I know that it's a bit of a meme that I always talk about plus one air weapons or plus two air weapons. This is solid by the way by Showtime. Wow. Pulls the queens out of position with the void where the oracle sweeps in there, three drones. This is a much better start. Well, you're talking about it. You said it last game. He killed four drones when they were over 60 on the map. Now he gets three drones when it's, yeah, it's a little bit, they hurt a little bit more to lose at this point. And mm -hmm. behind it, that second Stargate is finishing up, the plus one air weapons like you were talking about. And I could not agree with you more. I feel like there are so many moments in when these PVZ games where the Protoss actually does focus on those upgrades. They get to about that 170, 180 supply, plus three attack is finishing. And then they say to themselves, actually, I'm going to wait. Let the Zerg get a second Spire, get all their upgrades and then all of a sudden, my early advantage is just totally worthless. Yep. I mean, uh, I'll think back every now and then of not the most recent stay-at-home story cup, but the one before that Stats actually managed to win. Now, of course, different maps, perhaps slightly different meta back then, but Stats found a lot of success against Herald by just getting those carriers up out and going. He just went for it. The moment plus two was done, he took fights near Spore Crawls over and over again. And you could just see that games ended on moments you didn't think it was going to end because no Protoss ever really commits the way that Stats did. Now Stats obviously had a lot of phenomenal moves with little move outs here and there, tiny gateway armies. Uh, it's actually a shame that that was, a, I think, one of his absolute best performances. And right after that, he was forced to say goodbye to us for a while. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more, though. I would love to see when the Protoss kind of takes the initiative. And I, I, I guess you have enough games or some experience against certain types of players where you get punished for that, but you need to. You know, what's a, what's a, what's a competition? How do you become a champion without risking a little bit? You know, you have, you have to have at least that confidence in yourself. There's the Fleet Beacon, so he should be able to get into plus two quickly. We might see him go into, what do you think? Flux veins for harass on the void. Yeah, yeah. I think when you have this many void rays, uh, it's almost be a shame not to. And that's cool. Now denying creep is going to be very important because maybe then the, the void rays can sneak in and get on top of a hatchery without all the queens being there. Shotem does drop a revelation. I think he just wants to see his hive already on the way. Are we getting another ridiculously quick hive? There it is, and it's being fired up. Wow! I think the revelation is still active. So Shotem should know that he can be building void rays forever. Because Void Rays are really good until Vipers and uh, Investors come out. Then they fall off incredibly quickly. He is firing up a couple carriers, though. 
straight into the carriers. And with that, I, I, I mean, obviously, money becomes a little bit of an issue, especially because, you know, we, we talk about these being late game army compositions, and we're at the seven minute mark with the fleet bake and Dawn and a hive halfway finished. So, of course, it does take a little bit longer to, to get the upgrades. They're going to make these units as powerful as they need to be. But I like seeing the Void Rays get out there. Actually, has the second group split off to the bottom. Not utilizing speed, but instead trying to do a little multi-prong Void Ray harass. Kevin, I, I don't think I mind that too much at all. No, it's becoming more popular. I've seen Max Packs do it in very cool ways. Sometimes even having three squads of Void Rays. And then it becomes very hard for the Zerg because Queens are amazing. As long as they're together, right? But you don't really want to have two Queens fighting three or four Void Rays. Because then they can't really heal each other up forever. Don't lose the Oracle Showtime. 15 Mutilus, by the way. Now, that's something I didn't see huh. coming. We had that Spire done, but the Hive is on the way. Cero is going to fire up 15 Mutas. He does... Oh, 18. my goodness. What? 18. That's so many. Uh, this is going to be really cool. If Shotem doesn't see it, it's going to be very hard. If he sees it right here, right now, you can always make three Phoenixes at a time, and then it's not all that bad. And in a straight-up fight, the Mutas are not going to be that good either. They'll be okay against the Void Rays. They are not good against the Carriers. Carriers simply have too much HP. I think that's an excellent point to bring up. You, he, he actually needs to do something to get that information. Flux Veins does begin. That what he needs is any on pulse crystals. Or yeah, uh, it's 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 like he has enough money that building the 1920 mutilus, like he could try to go into something else. It doesn't have to just be you know a full commitment. But now as they fly into the base and start to work on that economy, it's just Showtime's army is on the other side of the map. So he's gonna need to do some crazy amount of damage while trying to defend against this. And he's doing he's doing his defense by warping in stock rather than the Phoenix, perhaps just a, a bit of an issue in terms of the money or the resources that are available. One of the carriers getting very low, wow. lots of Biles coming in to try and zone the Void Rays off of the Spore Crawlers and using that prism with a ton of gateways to try and reinforce. I think Cyril's doing almost everything right here. He's hitting the Corrosive Biles. The Queens are doing an amazing job in just making sure that this fight goes on and on. The longer it goes on, the better it will be, of course, for Cyril because he still has a better economy. But he still needs to respect this. And one carrier took a lot of damage, but it hasn't gone down yet so sure the mutas are picking up pretty much everything on the other side of the map but Cero is still gonna have to clean up this army and that's not going to be all that easy the queens have used the majority of the energy already Nate. Uh, there's still a couple of transfuses left though those spore crawlers have been holding strong the drones getting moved away from that mineral line but like you were saying those biles are starting to connect it's having a hard time keeping everything uh. where it needs to be the oracle does come up to try and help with those drones but as the void ray count gets knocked down and all of the interceptors are dead there's just not enough gas in the tank for showtime to do it Serral wins two to zero Sport Crawlers came in ultra handy there. They just did a good job in keeping the Void Rays at bay, picking off the inter 